Well, if, if you haven't heard of this, it's because perhaps you have taken some kind of fast of the news to some degree, or you don't like to read the news or hear the news, or you haven't had time, or whatever it may be to not say anything else. But honestly, I think everybody has heard something about this picture that is up there at this point. The name that draws to your attention at this time and my attention is the name Costa Concordia. The ship that was wrecked off the coast, off the uh, Tuscan coast in the island of Giglio, I believe I pronounced that correct. 450 million dollar vessel, 4,200 people. 11 did not survive, and 21, as of the count that I'm aware of right now, are still missing. Tragic. It happened last weekend. But there's a certain name that popped up right after this happened. And you know, when you see images like this, a lot of things go through our minds, right? One of the things that quickly happens is that the price of going on a cruise completely drops for some reason. And then the desire to go on a cruise kind of goes away. Now, I've, my wife and I have been honored to be able to go on a few of these cruises. So when we saw pictures of this, we were like, whoa. You know, we got to rethink that next one whenever that next one may be. But then the name of, well, the captain. Captain Francisco Schettino. You don't want to be Francisco Schettino at this time in your life. You don't even want to have the name Francisco Schettino, especially if you live in Italy. The news of, of what I have read, and I've tried to read a lot and catch up because it's kind of fascinated me, this story and everything that, ha that has intertwined the aspect of this story regarding now the captain and what he did. And so in, in Italy, what has surfaced is that this, this uh, shirt has now come up that is selling quite well. And the, the shirt that is selling quite well actually says a powerful phrase. I cannot tell you the complete phrase because then I probably wouldn't be able to preach here again. So I'm not going to give you the complete phrase of what the shirt in Italy says overall to some degree, but, but it's right from a conversation that happened between Francisco the captain and a Coast Guard officer named Gregorio del Falco. Gregorio del Falco is speaking to Francisco in this recording, and I'm reading the transcription, right? And essentially, he's telling the captain, who we seem to have, according to reports that I have read, he seems to have fallen into a, a life raft. Now, I, I don't know how you fall into a life raft, and the other 4,200 don't seem to fall the same way you did, but I don't, I don't, I'm not a captain. And so, they're speaking to him, and the Coast Guard official says, get back on the ship, bleep, bleep. Can't tell you the rest, you can figure it out. Get back on the ship. And then the captain seems to be asking the Coast Guard, well, you know, how many are missing, all this stuff, and he says, what do you mean, how are you asking me? You're supposed to know, this is all in Italian, right? I'm paraphrasing here. He says, get back on the ship. So now Italians have made shirts that say get back on the, you know, with the bad word and the whole nine yards and they're selling them and, and, and that's the world that we live on. It's on Facebook and e everything now. This guy's a hero because he's telling this captain who is supposed to be on the ship, get back on the ship. What are you doing on the life raft? The law states you're supposed to be the last one standing. You're supposed to be on that ship telling people where to go, what to do, telling us what's going on. And just recently, today, I believe information has come out. One of the CEOs of the cruise line spoke to the captain, it's been said, last week at 10.05 p.m., some 20 minutes after the ship ran, uh, uh, ran on the ground on January 13th, but could not offer proper assistance, listen carefully, because the captain's description did not correspond to the truth. Francisco Schettino said only that he had, this is, I quote, problems 
on board, but did not mention hitting a reef. So likewise, uh, this, this crew members were not informed of the gravity of the situation. Now, passenger video, shocking, you know, 21st century, 2012, there's, there's video of everything going on, different clips, you know, because in this day and age, when something happens, just like in here as I'm speaking, there's people looking online, there's people going on their cell phones, you know, I've said things, and, and people have come to me later, said, Pastor, while you were speaking, you, I was checking on my phone about what you said. I said, good, I, I, hopefully you were not texting somebody, but that's okay, text them, tell them to go watch on collegedrivechurch.com, please. As a matter of fact, stop right now, grab your phone and text somebody and say, watch on collegedrivechurch.com. You have full permission. The passengers were taking videos and on a video shot on Italian TV indicates that crew members were telling passengers to go to their cabins as late as 10.25 p.m., their time, of course. The abandoned ship, listen carefully, sounded the alarm to abandon the ship at 11 p.m. And that's because they, they also did not receive correct information on the gravity that was going on. The Coast Guard didn't receive it. It's amazing. This captain gives bad information. He flees the ship while 4,200 people, which obviously includes the crew, are left to maneuver their way out of this ship. Chaos. In the wake of this terrible tragedy, obviously our hearts go out to those who have lost loved ones and those who are still waiting to hear those, what has happened to the ones missing. But I gotta be honest with you, thus far, I could say more. It is incredible the lessons one can learn from what has happened in this terrible tragedy. And if it's one thing you want to learn at the very least from a, from a tragedy such as this, you want to learn so that it doesn't, say it with me, so that it doesn't happen again. If you were here last week, and if not, the, give you the sermons online, the video and audio, it's, they're podcasted. If you were here last week, you will recall that we had the story of John chapter 9 as we continue our journey in the Gospel of John of the blind man who was healed by Jesus. He was healed by Jesus, but then he was an outcast because the religious folks of that time, we can say, pushed him out, right? Yet he was being wooed, he was being pursued, as we talked about, by Jesus, but all the religious folks, you know, the, the, the righteous ones, they were pushing him away, and they did. Get out of here. You, don't, you, you can't come here. And with that in mind, Jesus now begins to say something because it flows from John chapter 9. John chapter 10, the first part of it, one can say, follow me here, feeds off John chapter 9 with that story of somebody who was cast out that Jesus was pursuing while the religious leaders cast him out. And then Jesus says this, John chapter 10, are you with me church? John chapter 10, verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, and they know his voice, yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, listen carefully to what is said in, chapter, in verse 6 of chapter 10. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Now, Jesus uses this illustration. In the Gospel of John, Jesus does not, we don't see any parables. This is not really a parable. He's comparing something, but it's not really a parable. And in verse 7, okay, you don't understand what's going on. Let me make it clear to you guys. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly I say to you, he says, I am the what? The door of the sheep. 
All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door, he repeats. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. In verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. As Jesus is saying this, you have to understand as he's talking and giving this illustration of the good shepherd, you know, sheep in a pasture. Let's be honest, to most of us, it means not very much. We've heard the illustration, we've heard Jesus the good shepherd, we've heard all this, but does anybody here have sheep? I've been to a lot of your homes and you guys have a lot of different animals. Some of you have more animals than you probably should, but that's your choice. The point being is that you don't have sheep. And I haven't seen a lot of sheep in most people's homes here. I grew up city kid. I, don't, I, I saw a sheep when I was a lot older than probably I should have seen a sheep. So when we see this illustration or read it, it's kind of distant for us to some degree or to most of us. But to the people that were listening to it, specifically those there as Jesus was given to it, given it to them, it was something that was very obviously common, something very close to them. So this illustration, this talk that he was giving here about the sheep and him being the door and that's the way was really becoming very vivid to them, very clear to them of what shepherds did in the dumbness of sheeps. Sheeps aren't very bright animals, are they? In John chapter nine, as we flow into John chapter 10, Jesus essentially begins and is telling this illustration one can say. And he's saying, don't make it hard to follow me. Don't make it hard to follow me. These religious leaders had just made it very difficult and basically excommunicated this man who was healed by Jesus. And those were the thieves that were robbers that they were making their own way of religion, a way to a higher sphere, and it wasn't the way. They were taking what only belongs to Jesus away from Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the way, I am the door, and I am the shepherd. Which leads us to a psalm that, that, that you and I, I would venture to say, I don't have to tell you which psalm it is, because as soon as I began to say the psalm, you will know which psalm it is. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, what psalm is this church? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Are you making it hard to follow Jesus for others? Have you asked yourself, why do you want to follow Jesus? Why do you really want to follow Jesus? Do you want to follow Jesus for the mansions that awaits us? The streets of gold? The great fruit and food? Why do you follow Jesus? Because there's not going to be any bills in heaven, no sickness, no pain. Those seem to be very good things, right? A lady by the name of Ellen White says the following that to me spoke a lot. Listen to the first, just the first sentence. 
It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. Wait a minute, I thought it was the reward. You know, heaven. Wait, I, I thought it was, you know, tell them that if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell and that will lead them, right? Speak harsh judgment to them. That's the way, you know, some of us have grown up that way. Some of us have made it hard for others to follow Jesus, you know? Because if you go to that place, the angels of God won't go with you. Somebody has heard that before, and more explicitly, in different ways perhaps, right? Follow me here, hold on. They behold the Savior's matchless love, revealed through his pilgrimage on earth. From the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross, and the sight of him attracts, it softens and subdues the soul. Love awakens in the hearts of the beholders. They hear his voice, and they follow him. It seems to me that too often we have made it perhaps, perhaps for some of us, have made it hard I believe and give people the benefit of the doubt that it hasn't been intentional. But we have made it hard at times to follow Jesus. Have our lives been examples that show forth that love of Jesus that people want to follow the Jesus that you are proclaiming? Or are we making it difficult? Is, is our religion making it difficult? Now, now listen, I know there's this tension. Because people will say, well, following Jesus isn't always great. You know, things happen and so on and so on. And I agree. But sometimes the way that we proclaim this Jesus that we believe in makes it as hard to follow him. And we basically excommunicate, push people away, just like this blind man in chapter 9 was pushed away and not accepted. Because he wasn't like them. He was following this man named Jesus. Sometimes we put our doctrine above all else, and if you don't exactly do it like this, then you can't be like that. Because the reality is that doctrine minus Jesus is death, is imprisonment forever. Now, doctrine plus Jesus, in the light of Jesus, is eternal life. Because Jesus is eternal life. It's first and foremost, he is the door. Too many people have grown up, specifically at times in the Adventist church, have grown up with this way of thinking of punishment and the do's, and they really haven't experienced and seen others. At times, maybe it doesn't apply to you. Truly, the love of Jesus. Maybe they haven't seen it in the church as a whole. And so it is made hard for them because all they see is the opposite of love. And as we're reading here and as we read in the Bible clearly, if it is the love that softens people and they don't see it, then why would they want to follow it? They hear his voice and they follow him. They follow Jesus, the head shepherd, the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. And the reality is that maybe we just want more. Is Jesus enough for you? If Jesus is all you have, is that enough? Because I want to tell you that the chief shepherd has not abandoned the ship, he has seen the wreckage in the ship. And the ship is doomed to sink, I guarantee you, because the Bible says it will sink. But the chief shepherd has not abandoned this, the ship. He stayed on the ship. He came to the ship. And now he is waiting for everybody to get off. And if people don't want to get off, if they want to stay on the ship, here it is. Yes, nobody will snatch them, as we're going to read, as we'll read in a moment. Nobody will snatch those that are Christ away. But you have the choice to either stay on the ship, though it's sinking. You have that choice. Or you have the choice to follow the shepherd off of the ship. But he's there, and he's still here. He's waiting, he's wanting. 
but the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I want to go back. I want to go back on the ship because there's, there's things there that I'm missing. My iPhone and iPad is on that ship. I need them. I know how that feels, right? Some of you do too. My nuke is on that ship. Wait a minute, my, my test is on that ship. My study notes. My credit cards, my pictures. If Jesus is all you had, would that be enough? Are you wanting to go to heaven because there's the streets of gold or the one who makes the gold? Somebody say hallelujah. See, the beauty is that today Jesus, the lead shepherd, is speaking to us. Don't make it hard for people to follow Jesus. In this journey in life, they will clearly see that following Jesus is gonna require a commitment. You see, too often, hearing the shepherd and hearing that voice requires a response. But too often in our Christian experience, I have battled this myself. And, and what I'm battling is that for too long, even growing up, sometimes one felt that what Jesus wanted was a good Christian, a good Seventh-day Adventist Christian. The problem is, as I got older and perhaps a little bit analytical, I began to question the aspect of what is good, Greg? And as I looked deeper myself in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy for us here, I began to realize that, that, that God isn't looking for good Christians, or God isn't looking for good people. Because last time I checked, atheists, some of them are really good. They pay their mortgage, if they have one. They feed the homeless through a church organization or through whoever, right? They're good people. People of different religions are good people. I've met some very good Muslims, Hindus, they're good people, morally correct, don't cheat on their spouse, work hard, some work multiple jobs, multiple business. They're good people. Is God just wanting good people? Because if it is, that's all he wants. Then how do we define good? Where is good? Because if good, and I've used this example before, I know clearly, but I want to stress it again. If good is Mother Teresa, I'm in bad shape. So now as I look at here, I think, not judging or anything, but some of you look to be in bad shape too. So God is not looking for good people. He's looking for committed people. He's looking for people that will say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. I'm committed to Jesus. I may fall, I may have issues, but I'm gonna get up and I'm still committed to uh, you know, Jesus because, because we hear that voice. Verse 27, and I wanna make clear that verses one through 21 in chapter 10 flow with chapter nine, but verse 22 as you read the first I mean, as you read verse 22, you see that it is now the Feast of Dedication. About two months have passed since. But the theme is still there, because in verse 27, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. A couple of weeks ago, um, I was uh, chatting with somebody that I highly respect, and, and um, on social networks on one of the social networks, yes, on Twitter. And it was good, it was actually Pastor Nelson. Can you believe that? Pastor Nelson is on Twitter. Pastor of Pioneer Memorial Church at Andrews, the campus of Andrews University. And he's the one that did our devotional this year uh, for our church, and hopefully you guys all have it. If not, please, you should go and get one. And he, he, he tweeted a picture and I said, I need that picture. 
And he said, I said, can I use that? He said, absolutely. He said, you know, it's a great picture to use when you speak or if you ever speak on John chapter 10. I said, absolutely. And so I've waited, I've had this. I couldn't wait to share it because the question is, are you hearing that voice? And when I saw this picture, I said, that said it all. I couldn't blow it up anymore. And so I'm not sure if you're able to see it best. But in the little figurine there, it says, I wonder why I don't hear from the shepherd anymore. And you see he's got his his flat screen TV, which is not so flat. He's got his um, laptop. Um, it's a PC, so I, I understand why. And then it's, a, it's he got his radio. He's got his Bible. Look at his Bible there. He's got the news. He's got, he's got, he's talking about, and it's even, some of it is even religious. You know, he's got Adventist World Radio. He's got 3ABN over here. And he, okay, maybe he's got College Drive over here. And he's got 3ABN over here. And he's watching all these religious things, but he still isn't listening to the voices. He's listening to a lot of voices, and there's nothing wrong with that. But at some point, you're going to have to stop and listen to the voice of God. God speaks to people. Hallelujah. I have to believe that. I'm a preacher. I know God speaks to people. God speaks through your lives and my life. God speaks to the wonderful ministries we have. Adventist World Radio, 3BN, Hoach, all that good stuff. But at some point, you're even going to have to tune that off. At some point, you're going to have to listen to the voice of God. I know that is hard, but if God spoke to people in the Bible, then he speaks to us today. The question is not that. The question is, are you listening? Are you allowing the time to listen after you've had your devotions, after you've read your word of God? And when you listen to the voice of the Lord, I'm almost guaranteeing you that it propels us to action. But you know what happens is that the devil comes in and then he gives us other information. And so then we begin to struggle with which one are we gonna follow? And and, and normally, it's easy to follow the one voice that we shouldn't be hearing. Come on now. It's easy to follow. Just spend a few more minutes watching this television program. Just spend a few more minutes, again, reading more news. Like, how many times can you read the same thing in different areas? The question is, Are we really stopping to listen to the voice of God? Because when you hear that voice, when you listen to that voice and you obey that voice, it will say, the Lord is my shepherd. We will be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. This week, I've done it before obviously, but this week in particular, I had some great conversations in different ways. But the conversations honestly were a little bit heartening because there were conversations with people that have left this church. Now I got your attention, huh? Now you woke up. And this is not pointing a finger. This is not shifting any blame. This is not saying what is right, what is wrong. And don't ask me who it was because I'm not gonna tell you. Don't ask me who I spoke with because I'm not gonna tell you. But the one thing that I will say is what has already been said. Don't make it hard to follow Jesus. Don't make the way to Jesus neither me nor you. Make the way to Jesus, Jesus. And that's gonna require that we hear that voice so that we can follow the shepherd off of the ship. Don't make the way to heaven the way that you lived your life exactly the way that you panned it out since you were three years old and your parents told you exactly how to live. Because you know that it's changed over time. Now there's black and white and there's right and wrong. Don't misunderstand me. And there's the aspect, I've mentioned it, there's the aspect of commitment and listening to that voice and following it. And we're all responsible. And we can't point fingers because all of us will have to give an account to God. And, and it's not like the way we believe and we understand it's not that we're gonna give an account to God at some point in the future. You're giving an account to God now. Like I am. And all I'm gonna say 
don't make the way to God hard. If I have made it hard, please forgive me. If you've made it hard for somebody, be convicted and go to that person and say, for, forgive me, because maybe you have. If you've made it hard for a, for a friend or family member, your child, your grandchildren, say I'm sorry. Be Christian enough to understand enough that you're not enough. That Jesus is all we need so that we can say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and let me tell you that I've walked that valley in my own life, and many of you know it, but you don't know the half of it and you never will. And I've always heard growing up, you know, the Lord is not with you in this, and the, and, and the angels of God, as I mentioned before, aren't with you when you do this, and when you're in this place and that place. Let me tell you, if the angels of God weren't with me in places of evil, I wouldn't be here right now. There's a context, there's an understanding to that. I understand the principle. I understand the aspect of willful sinning. But even in the midst of that, to me, you, it's my life, I understand. I saw God's hand pull me out of there. I saw God, for some reason, save me from destruction, from despair, even in the midst of my life of sin. I could only give you my example, I could give you examples of others, but that won't carry the same weight. I could give you my own. God didn't excuse it. He didn't say it was right. He said, get out of the ship, it's sinking. I saved you here and I'll save you again. And sometimes I'm gonna allow things to happen so you could wake up. And then you wake up and you go back on the ship because you want more. And you don't hear the voice of God, though I'm always talking to you and I'm always with you and I'm always there for you. And you know that I am. And as a matter of fact, at the end of time, I'm gonna make sure you understand that I was always with you. And there was no excuse in the world for you to still have been on the ship. So we're reversing it. Get off of the ship. I'm going to leave the curse word out. Because if you don't get off the ship, I won't curse at it, but we're dumb if we don't get off. Because when we see Jesus dying on the cross for all of us, when we see his matchless love, when we see that even while we're yet sinners, he's still helping us. I mean, he still gives us the things that we don't deserve. He still is with our kids. When we're bad examples to our own family, friends, neighbors, children, if you have them, he's still merciful. What that does and should compel us is to get off of the ship and change. When we hear that voice, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And so I want to make an appeal to you today as we close. I want to make an appeal to you in the name of the chief shepherd. Because my desire is for this church in the midst of our brokenness and in our unperfection, and I know we are imperfect, but if you show me a perfect church, then please let me know because I'll go to it. But in the midst of our imperfections, in the midst of our brokenness, I want to consistently be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. I don't want to make it hard for people to follow Jesus. In other words, I don't want to be a stumbling block. I know truth is truth, and I've heard that a long time. But sometimes the way that you say it's truth is a stumbling block for the one who doesn't even understand truth. Because they're listening to the wrong voice. They're on the ship and they don't want to get off. So we got to be careful what we say and how we say it. On this platform, you can get away with saying a little bit more. But when I start talking to people, it's a little bit different. Because they expect it up here. Is the Lord enough for you? So that the Lord is my shepherd and I should not be in want. If you want to tell Jesus today, Lord, I want you to be my shepherd. I want to be able to say that I don't want anything. Lord, honestly, maybe I can't say that right now. If I'm just truly honest with myself, 
I'm, I'm struggling because there's things that I want. But you're enough, Jesus, and I know that. So if that's your desire, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads with me. I, I, don't, I don't want people to come forward today. If you wanna kneel, please go ahead. But I want you to just stop in these next few minutes and I just want you to pray to the Lord, to our captain, to the shepherd, so that we will even improve it's time to step it up. It's time to really be and continue to be, I'm not saying that we haven't, but to really show forth that love. And that love is shown in many ways. To not be a stumbling block to others. For the Lord to give us that wisdom. To hear the voice of God and all that is composed in the aspect that Jesus be all. That we won't need anything else for he himself says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else shall be given unto you. I'll take care of everything else for you. Pray to him. I publicly pray, Lord, that you forgive me if I have ever, and I know I have, made it hard for people to come close to you. Either by my example or something I said and Lord, I pray corporately that you forgive us. Lord, you are our shepherd. And yes, Lord, as a shepherd and your representative here, there are people who are struggling and I know. I pray for those, Lord, who are really struggling. I pray for the people that I've spoken to this week. You know who they are. I pray those that are here and are struggling. Lord, if, if I don't get to them, please, Lord, use somebody else to get to them. Touch somebody else's heart and let them know that we love them, we do. Let them hear your voice and be committed, Lord, and follow in being fully committed to you and to move forward in faith, believing that you have forgiven them, cleansed them, empowered them, and that you will help them in every aspect of their life. But Lord, help us to say, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. For you are enough. Lord, thank you for listening to us. But most of all, Lord, I thank you because we have heard your voice. Now may we follow it and not want anything else. For I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. May God bless you. May his face shine upon you. And you have a great Sabbath, and I hope you can join us for lunch. Blessings to you.